as Associate Dean for Inclusivity, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility of the Newhouse School, I'd like to welcome everyone to this important conversation tonight. First, I'd like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Our Leaders in Communication is a monthly event, a speaker series that brings media leaders, influencers, and newsmakers to the Newhouse School for candid and insightful conversations with students and guests. With a special emphasis on current trends and challenges, the series helps students keep a pace of a quickly changing communications industry and provides them with a connection to the professions they will eventually lead. The series also offers valuable networking and learning opportunities as guests visit classrooms or student organizations, in addition to participating in the public conversation. The series is supported by the Her Speakers Fund. Now I wanna share a little bit about our speaker uh, that we will be hearing from this evening. Alumnus Jay Francis is Vice President of Content and Inclusion uh, at the Disney Television Animation. DTVA. He is responsible for the creation of key initiatives, strategies, and training programs to produce a diverse, creative, and inclusive workforce across TVA. Jay joined Disney TVA in 2007. During his tenure, he has overseen creative direction on a multitude of original animated series, including Disney's five-time Emmy Award-winning Venus and Ferb. Emmy Award nominated Big City Greens, Amphibia, and most recently, the Disney Plus original animated adventure movie, Finies and Ferb, the movie, Candace Against the Universe. In his most recent role, Jay has created the highly successful DTVA writing program. The DTVA original shorts lab and the apprentice songwriter program. For his work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, Jay has been honored by Variety Magazine's Inclusion Impact Report 2022, Black Woman Anim Animates Trailblazer Award 2021, and one of Cable Facts' most influential multi-ethnic executives tw in 2020. I am thrilled that this conversation is being moderated by a current Newhouse student, David Anthony Barbier Jr., David is a television, radio, and film senior and a Syracuse University Posse Scholar. I look forward to a great conversation. David, I will now pass it over to you. Thank you for that introduction. So looking forward to this conversation. And thank you guys for being so flexible and joining us on the Zoom platform. Jay, are you ready to get started? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me clearly? I can. Thank you for having me, David. And thank you to Raquel and Holly and all the team, Amanda as well. Thank you. Thank you for being flexible and joining us as well. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, we have to get started. We have to know and understand who's in front of us today, but that's very much a product of where you came from. So talk to us a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Well, you know, um, <laughs> trying not to date myself too much here. So, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know about the whole childhood, but um, I, can, I can try to remember that far back. Um, so actually- You can believe it, I believe in you. <laughs> I actually, um, I was born and raised in Boston um, and, um, uh, briefly moved to Maryland um, in the late 60s as my dad was a part of the Lyndon Johnson administration on the health uh, in the health department. Um, we moved back to Boston early 70s and that's really where I sort of grew up. Um, went to um, 
uh, went to Syracuse in um, 1979, graduated in 1984. And um, I, I guess in terms of my journey to there, um, I, I will just, I will uh, share a story that um, I think everything has a reason for being. I am um, uh, in uh, 1978, Thanksgiving 1978. Um, um, I had an application on my desk in my in in my um, bedroom to go to UCLA. I, I, I knew back then I was sort of headed to LA. Um, unfortunately, um, that was the year that we had a fire in our house, and um, no one was hurt. Um, the house, my room in particular was gutted. And um, in 1978, you could not, um, you could not just upload, there was no internet <laughs> to, to upload your uh, application for. So it was too late at the time for me to sort of, uh, uh, sort of resub try to resubmit. So um, I had, I, I think if memory serves, I had already gotten accepted into Syracuse. So, that's what actually landed me in Syracuse, but I guess it was foretelling because I ended up in LA after the fact anyway, so. So as fate would have it, you ended up in Syracuse, but still ended up in LA. Yes, yeah. Now I know the Syracuse you went to, I'm sure was very similar to the Syracuse I go to right now, <laughs> but what was your SU experience like while you were here? Well, so, um, it, you know, we can use the events of last night for the reason I'm not there. That, that part of the Syracuse experience is very, is exactly similar to mine. A lot of snow, a lot of cold, and um, in this particular case, uh, kept me from being in person. Um, um, I think, you know, my experience at Syracuse was I think like a lot of people, you know, first time you have that individual freedom, it's kind of scary, you know, and um, Syracuse is not that far away from Boston, but it might as well have been around the world, as far as I was concerned, just in terms of the, um, the experiences and the uh, the, I guess, the social learnings. I mean, you have your schoolwork and everything, but, you know, my experience at Syracuse was learning, learning who I was, learning how to interact with people um, from different cultures um, with different points of view. And I don't know that I knew it at the time, but that was the biggest learnings and the biggest takeaway I I was uh, getting from my Syracuse experience. It wasn't so much out of the books, but it was just the um, uh, the connection with people. And um, I, I think that would be the one thing I would say I could, I, I could take away from, from that experience is that how much I matured over the course of my time at Syracuse and became... Um, um, became an adult. I mean, like, quite, quite frankly, I mean, had to sort of learn how to take care of myself. And um, it was, you know, during that time that um, I really started to just open myself up to different pathways in terms of career, in terms of life in general. So I owe Syracuse a lot um, with regard to um, uh, my maturing. Is there a particular time at SU that you think you can pinpoint at which you knew you wanted to do storytelling or was that something you think you understood beforehand? <laughs> I think I understood beforehand, although I didn't have a specific, uh, it's, a, it's a really great question because um, up until that point, it was my junior year in high school and actually that I took a, a, a this elective in high school that was being offered because you were, um, excuse me, you were supposed to and it was this, um, film critique. Actually, I don't even know that it was called film critique, but that's what the class was about. Um, the the instructor there just basically took the whole semester. We watched It's a Wonderful Life, and we sort of broke down all the aspects of 
how one would make this film, the selections, the the, the creative, um, all the creative aspects from it, from the the cinematography to the sound to the um, casting to the shot selection, all that aspect, and it dawned on me for the first time that wait, you you can have a career in this, you know, and. Whereas I think most people would have taken it as like, oh yeah, no, I want to be a director. I want to be a producer. I want to be a writer. None of that connected with me directly. What I did know is just like, I was looking at this sort of magic on the screen and recognized that, oh, that could be something for me just in terms of, um, you know, wanting a job, <laughs> sort of doing that or being part of that or being part of how they how they make that. So um, so that's where I sort of got that bug, which is why, you know, a Syracuse, a UCLA, I think Boston University, NYU or other schools that I, I applied for, all of a sudden I had a direction in terms of not just applying to a liberal arts program, right? Or a curriculum. It was so now I was selecting schools that had really strong communication programs. And so, so that's where I got the bug, but I didn't really have a specific sort of, I want to do this in the entertainment industry. I just knew that there was something about the whole process of storytelling that I really gravitated to. You brought up this idea of like finding the magic and just wanting to be a part of it. And you quite literally work at, I think, I'm, it's safe to say that like a company that is responsible for creating magic stories that contain magic. Can you tell us how you got there? So um, I, I think the, the the story for that even goes back um, further than when I got there because I you know I'd already been in the animation industry and and that's another aspect of this. So when I did go out to LA, it was with this idea of. I just want to get a job in the entertainment industry. There wasn't that sort of uh, uh, specificness to it. Um, but I went out there incredibly naive, <laughs> incredibly ignorant, in a blissful way, I might add, because um, I went out there. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anything about Los Angeles. I always joke that everything I knew about Los Angeles at that time, I like sort of picked up from Beverly Hills Cop, you know, that, that Hollywood and Beverly Hills were not different to me until I actually got there. It's like, oh, it's very different. I thought all major cities had, um, you know, uh, subways and public transportation. I I thought, thought, sure, I didn't need a car in LA. And so that was, you know, that was a mistake, um, but you learn from those. Um, I think just in terms of my perspective is I want to go out to LA and get a job in the entertainment industry. And if, and when I ran out of money in doing that, I figured I'd just come back home. And, um, and that's sort of what happened. But in the meantime, I just started putting my resumes around to every place. I just went around, I snuck on to lots. Uh, he, I, I, you know, back, in those days, you didn't have a cell phone, you didn't have the internet, so you had to have your own, you know, briefcase of resumes, you had um, a, a book of addresses of the places you thought you might want to put a resume at, you had a physical map to get you to where you needed to go, and you did a lot of walking, so um, it was at this sort of end as I was sort of running out of money running out of money where I was a lot more uh, not as discerning in terms of where I would drop the rest of my resumes off before I had to head back home. And I remember it was, um, I was uh, coming over from Hollywood into, and, and by the way, this was, um, this was right after I graduated. So this was like fall of 80, 1984. And um, I was on this bus and I was coming over the Cahuenga Pass for those who are familiar with, with, with LA. And in 1984, if you, if you took that route over from Hollywood into um, Studio City, 
um, the first major entertainment company that you would have seen a sign for was the old Hanna-Barbera Studios. And I just remember seeing these, you know, the Fred Flintstone flags and Johnny Quest and Yogi Bear. And I had never once thought of, I mean, we all grew up with cartoons, man. I, mean, I had never once thought about that specific part of the industry as the entertainment industry. It never crossed my mind. And I'd venture to say, if it did, I would have quote, I would have dismissed it as, well, you know, I'm not an animator, I'm not a writer, so there's nothing there for me. But in my desperation, as I was running out of money and like I saw the, 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 the clock ticking, it just dawned on me that, well, I don't know how they make cartoons, but here's what I do know these guys have more on TV than anybody else I'm gonna give a resume to. So like, why not? So I got off that bus, walked in to the studio, which in 1984, you could still just walk on to, walk into some studios. There wasn't this whole, as much security as there is today, obviously. Um, and um, I always say the receptionist who never, who will never know how she changed the course of my life, sort of saw me from a mile away and said, oh, no, 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 we're not hiring here, but two companies that are always hiring. And she gave, she literally wrote down the addresses of these two small animation companies. She assumed that I was looking for a job in animation. I did not dissuade her of that because she said they're always hiring. So... I got the addresses, continued to walk down the street, and I couldn't find one of them. The other one was a small animation company, which ultimately ended up um, offering me a production assistant job. And that's how I started in animation. And I think, I've, David, I think I've told you this before. Um, I even remember thinking then it was just like, oh, I'll just do this until I get a real entertainment job. And I never left the, I never left this industry. So flip to, you know, working at different studios, doing different jobs, embracing the, the world of animation. Um, and um, after a couple, after one or two sort of tries, even with my own company, um, you know, my life priorities shifted and I, you know, I got married and had a couple of kids. And next thing you know, you know, running an independent company eh, just really didn't, you know, pay the bills the way it needed to. You know, I, I, I always say, you know, I can live off top ramen for a long time, but my wife and kids shouldn't be forced to do that. So so I had to like go out and get a real job. And at that point, my background in animation in terms of both production development, um, I went to over to Disney and I interviewed with them. I, I had learned that there was a, a development executive job um, at um, what was then called Disney Channels worldwide. And um, uh, it was a long process, but I finally got that job. And that's how I got into Disney. And I will say at this point, you know, for me, um, it wasn't Disney that I was getting a job at. It was a company who offered me a job. Like I did not associate the iconicness of Disney or that magic that you reference as Disney because, A, at that point, I remember I was pretty desperate for some work. And number two, I was just trying to survive it you know i've never worked in a large corporation like that the companies that i had worked at either if they were not my own then they were these sort of small mom and pop animation studios so the whole idea of working in this large corporation was pretty daunting and um i had struggles early to the point where i really didn't think i was going to be lasting too much long and and part of it in my head was maybe i'm just not you know, a like a corporate world type of guy. Um, but, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I found, I, I, I found my place, I found my footing. And it was once that, I, once I was comfortable with the job I had, then I could relax and get knowledge on what this company that I worked at was all about. The, the, you know, the, 
past and the heritage and the culture of the company and the movies. I never grew up with Disney animated features. That just wasn't, you know, when I was growing up, Disney features weren't really still sort of in vogue, so to speak, you know. Um, you know, Walt Disney had died in 1966 and the movies that they were producing, they weren't, they didn't really have the same impact. Um, um, and that didn't happen again until they, you know, Disney sort of revived, um, revived the feature in, industry in late 80s, early 90s. So, but once I sort of figured, like, I, I really got interested in the history of Disney and I, I embraced it and, um, and I sort of bought into the happiest place on earth. And I bought into the, again, all the iconicness of the company and the lot. And um, the fact that I was working at a company that, um, that animation was so, such an important part of its, um, uh, of its DNA. Um, and, um, Thankfully, I'm still here. You know, it's now um, my 16th year, so um, I must be doing something right. Clearly, because wow, um, in thinking about you're at Disney, and for you, I guess the way you look at Disney might be different from how my generation looks at Disney. What has it been like to create shows and content that literally impacts? generations we have Phineas and Ferb we have Gravity Falls we have Proud Family like these iconic tv show characters that kids literally grow up you know learning so much from yeah you know it's funny that um I never really thought about that aspect of it I think part of it Part of it came from the fact that, you know, there is a very specific difference between the feature animation side and the TV animation side. Um, so, you know, when we walk around our studio, you're not seeing the, you know, the Beauty and the Beast posters, or you're not seeing the uh, Sleeping Beauty or Fantasia. You're aware of it, of course, but, you know, the, the Disney TV animation history is just not the same. But absolutely to your point, the fact that um, animation is still animation and, you know, we were, our studio in terms of the things that we do and even in the shows that you mentioned and some others, um, uh, very proud of that heritage and what we brought, you, you know, subsequently to, to the history of that. So. Um, prior to, you know, uh, uh, and Raquel mentioned uh, in, in uh, introducing me, the writing programs and the things that I've been doing in the last three or four years, which I am incredibly proud of. Um, but before I, before I had that role, um, being the creative executive over Phineas and Ferb, was sort of the, I, I guess, and people would ask me like, what's your favorite show? Or if you left now, what would your legacy be? And and yeah, yeah, I mean, the fact that I recognized that I was working on a show that just brought so much joy to so many people, um, you know, I felt proud about that. I felt, I felt good about that. But, you know, for me, like I saw, so I wasn't the show creator and while I think I've done a very good job in, in, in that role, um, uh, there's so many talented executives like me. So I felt like somebody else could have um, could have um, done the job. So I didn't feel I didn't feel that sort of personal connection to it um, until people <laughs> like yourself were even asking me that question. It's just like. You know, when you see Phineas on all these different products, and even now, you know, we just announced that we're sort of doing more episodes of Phineas and Ferb, and just the the to your point, the immense connection and relatability that kids have to Phineas and Ferb. Um, um, I, yeah, it's it's a special feeling. You know, it, it really is a special feeling. So um, I, I think that. When you're working on shows and you and you're and you especially if you have a successful show, there's always that, that moment 
um, that they can never take away from you. And by that, what I mean, it's just like, you know, some shows you really think are good and they only last a year because of ratings, because of circumstances, whatever. Um, and um, some shows last for years, like Phineas and Ferb. So you just, you, it's not a science, right? It's, it's really, it's very subjective in terms of what will be a hit and, 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 and what won't be. But, you know, they can never take away that premiere day, the day that you finally get to show the world, like that first episode. And um, that was the challenge with development. Like in development, you worked just as hard and you were trying to create these shows, but ultimately so much of what you work on never saw the light of day. And from a human nature standpoint, that was kind of rough, you know? <laughs> it's like, you you know, you, you develop the show for a good year and a half, two years, and then at the end, it just didn't make it to the finish line. Um, in current, you know, in, in working as a current series executive on shows that have been greenlit and have come out of development, they can't take away that premiere day from you. And that's the day that's very special. And you see that show um, uh, actually on air and, uh, and you realize how much had gone into that. It's always satisfying. And, and, it, and so it's, it's kind of emotional too, when you finally see that. So I'm very proud of that aspect of it. And to the degree that, you know, when you go to Disneyland and you see kids wearing Phineas and Ferb paraphernalia, or you see, you, you know, um, kids like sort of standing around, like as the as the Phineas and Ferb characters walk around at the park, it's 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 special. It's really special. I am a big Phineas and Ferb fan. I really want to know if there's 104 days of summer vacation, but maybe we could talk about that another time. <laughs> I'm not, when, no place that I ever lived was there 104 days, and, and my kids well, certainly don't get 104 days. Well, Phineas and Ferb are singing it every time, so I think they might have set up something that has kids believing there's 104 <laughs> days. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And thinking about the shows that you create, what do you want people to come away from the content you've created? What is the message that you want people to take away? Well, you know, um, you, I, what we really do focus on at Disney is um, our brand. And our brand has always sort of stood for com comedy with heart and comedy with sincerity. You know, I'm, all, I'm always talking to writers who are trying to break into the business or artists who are trying to break into this business. and. Um, or even or folks who are trying to pitch shows to Disney. And they asked me, you know, what do you look for? Or, or, or what should I be thinking about? What questions should I be answering? And, and it ultimately circles around back to um, um, relating to your audience, you know, uh, connecting with your audience. So, with Disney, you know, and, and especially in the kids and family space in which I, which is my focus. I mean, I always, I'm asking myself certain questions about a script I'm reading or a pitch. And you, you know, it's, it, it, it always is focused on the character. It's less about the intricate plot or the high concept theme there's a lot of different elements that go into making a successful show, but ultimately, and this is not just true in kids and family. I mean, it's I, true, I, to me, it's true in every, any great story. It's, it's the characters. It's you connecting with that character, you rooting for that character, you caring about that character. So it's the storyteller's role, whether it's the writer, whether it's the director, whatever to convey and make and provide dimensionality and depth to the characters that you as an audience feel like, oh, that's like me, or I've experienced that, or this is someone who, you know, I can root for because the, the situation is, is similar to my life or, even to be frank, like he or she looks like me or they live in the place that like that I live in type of situations. 
I mean, I'm always I'm always telling writers, you, you, you know, you got to ask yourself these questions, like, you know, what is the character's point of view? What does the character want? Um, with our brand, it's obviously likable characters, but I always tell show creators and writers and what I say, like, yeah, it is a it, it, it is likable characters for for us, but likable doesn't equal not flawed likable doesn't equal not conflicted likable doesn't equal not making poor choices when you look at our shows you still um as a storyteller as a as a writer as a director you have to build stakes you have to have conflict right um so from that standpoint i'm i'm always i'm always sort of focused in on it's the character dimensionality it's a character personality is what you have to dig deep on and i think that's what we do very well at disney in terms of digging in deep to the characters so that your audience is relating to that so if you take a gravity falls or a Phineas and for example and those characters are so well developed that if you pull them out of the shows that you're familiar with and drop them into another scenario another another environment i'd venture to say you still want to go watch that show because you care about dipper and mabel you care about phineas and ferb and now it's not you know i mean we never did a phineas and ferb in school type of show because we just didn't want to do that but if that was the next iteration of phineas and ferb most likely you would want to see how phineas and ferb deal with life in, in school. So, so for, for us, it's always been about character. And to me, that is sort of been the hallmark of the success that, that Disney has. If you had to think about a character that just sticks out to you as your favorite character, who would it be? When I first started at Disney, when, and, and I think it still happens today, when you get, get hired by Disney, you have these, um, at least one or two orientation classes, meetings. And that question always comes up of like who your favorite character is. And for me, and interestingly enough, my wife as well, maybe that's why we that's why we got together. Um, um, Stitch was always a character that I sort of I, I want I wouldn't say like necessarily related to. I related to the movie itself and to this day i feel like it is a an underrated movie it still uh stands the test of time even though it was hand drawn and it doesn't have all the fancy sort of graphics and whatnot it's a story about family it's a story about belonging and it's a story about accepting and you know as cranky and as mean and as you know uh uncouth stitch was at the beginning ultimately the character had a heart there was a sincerity to the character and i think that again sort of connecting the dots to what our brand is and and why that character to me um comes to mind as a fair i have you know there's a lot of great characters in the in the disney library but stitch is the one that sort of just and I didn't even hesitate. I just remember, like, it was just like, boom, Stitch. Stitch was that character that I, I would say is my favorite. I I can't be mad at that. And that, like, touched the heartstring. Because, you know, when Stitch is, like, like, my early childhood. And I can't be mad at that franchise. Yeah, no, it's a great, it's a, it's it's still a great movie. You know, still a great movie. Any, any plans for... Any any plans for Lilo and Stitch to make a comeback? Can you can you let us uh, in on that? I, the only thing I can say to that is because it's it was publicly announced last week. I know they're doing a they're at least attempting a live action Lilo and Stitch, um, and um, it was in the it was in the news that um, and I can't remember the news and Zach Grafowitz that guy, you know I don't know how this is working but clearly that guy's going to be Stitch. <laughs> I don't know how they're going to do that, but um, so I think that's interesting. And um, um, we'll see how that, we'll see how that turns out. Yeah. 
Nice. Thank you for taking me down memory lane. Uh, earlier, you mentioned character driven stories. And when we think about character, we think about people we relate to. I want to pivot to your role in DEI and creating oh. characters that we can actually see ourselves in and how you as an executive are trying to make sure that your viewers feel seen. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And look, it's not lost on me in terms of, um, and I am certainly not alone in this assessment. I mean, um, you know, uh, the movies, the, 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 the entertainment business imitates life, you know? And um, I think for me in my journey, um, even pre-Disney, um, oftentimes I was in meetings where I was the only one who looked like me. And in my earlier days, when I was just sort of focused on surviving, <laughs> providing a place where I can sleep and eat and, and a career, um, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't say I wasn't aware of it, but, you know, at that time in my life, I just had, you know, head down and, and didn't think about it too much. One of the reasons I stayed in animation is that notwithstanding the fact that there were very few people who looked like me, um, is that I never felt, you know, outwardly pushed aside. Now, what was going on under, you know, under the microscope, so to speak, um, you know, I can't specifically say or and or the fact that again, when we talk about sort of uh, maturity, like that I didn't have a, a self-awareness of that. You know, what I, what I felt was like people were, people who worked in animation um, were very passionate about what they did. And it's a very collaborative business. And I felt welcomed into that world, you know? Um, um, because I've always said that what to me, why I, a big reason why I stayed connected in animation is because not only did it fulfill my sort of creative itch, um, but it also, um, I recognized the people who were working in it were, were passionate about what they did, but, and they took it seriously. They took seriously what they did. Uh, making cartoons, especially in the kids' world, making cartoons, but they never took themselves seriously, and that to me was the difference between, at like, in terms of my experience, like the sort of live action side versus the animation side. Like, most people who are working in animation love and are passionate about, about animation, and it's not just the job; it's what they what they want to do. But as you sort of go through and you, you know, you start to get older, mature, and you recognize different things and your life sort of, you know, points to different ways. And certainly your environment helps sort of drive a lot of that. You know, you see what's going on outside of your little cocoon, right? And it was about um I don't know, um, you know, when I took on this role of DEI, it was sort of um, with, with Disney, I had always felt like, you know, if we're gonna raise the flag for authentic storytelling, then we needed authenticity in terms of in front of and behind the cameras from all different points of view. That's, that's the, the, the definition of um, authenticity. So, you know, when I was, um, I guess, campaigning for my promotion, you know, one of the things in the corporate world you always have to remember is that, um, you know, you have to have a great performance review, right? Um, but you can't just use that or settle on that as, as a reason why you should be promoted because I think any good employer will tell you, it's like, well, yeah, but that's what we hired you to do. We, that was our expectation. So what else are you going to do to sort of, or where else you know, are you gonna to add to the mix? And it was there where I found an opportunity to say, well, you know what, this was, this was during the time of the Me Too movement more than anything at that point. And I just said, well, 
you know, I see some areas of improvement that we can sort of lean into, especially as a creative executive in the writing room. Um, but across the board, I would love to be part of, uh, of creating initiatives and the strategies that brought underrepresented people onto our radar in a bigger and bolder way. And, um, and um, to, to, to my, I guess, surprise to a certain degree, Disney sort of ag agreed with that because when I got my promotion, the term diversity was also put in my title. So I was like, oh, I thought this was just gonna be a little bit of a side hustle while I still did my uh, creative executive work. Um, but in putting that, putting that in my title, it meant I had to do something. And so that's what sort of got me into the thought process of like, well, I don't see a lot of uh, uh, underrepresented folks in writing rooms. I don't see a lot. I, I see more of them on the artist side, I will say that, but in production and in different areas of the company. So I just went about, and I and believe me, I'm no expert, you know, in this, but I just, it was what I was experiencing. So my thought was, listen to what people are telling me. Like people were trying to get into Disney, people who don't feel like they were getting, that they couldn't figure out how to get into Disney. They understood how competitive it is. And it is incredibly competitive. The bar is very high at Disney. But I think what I heard from a lot of people was just like, I just didn't want to, I want to talk, I want to be able to talk to somebody who can tell me what I need to bring to the table in order to compete, right? Because I never, you know, they never got that opportunity. So I sort of made it the focus of how I was going to handle this job and just to listen, listen to people and talk, talk with people and more often than not students, but folks who would listen to me on a podcast or saw, saw me on a panel or those who reached out to me on LinkedIn, they just want a little bit of time to just to have a conversation. So um, I use that to sort of bring knowledge to me in terms of like, okay, all these people are looking to do these different things. Is there a way for us to tap into this energy? Cause it's huge, you know? Um, and I don't think we as a company realize or recognize that. So I just started to work with our, and everyone aligned, it was fantastic. I mean, producers and directors and our legal team and our finance team to put together some initiatives that would help facilitate, not just a training program, you know, cause I mean, a lot of people like using writing program as an example, a lot of people will have writing programs that are there's a workshop here, a seminar there, a meet and greet with an executive and, and a sort of come back when you get some more experience. And it's not to say that those workshops and seminars are not valuable, but I wanted to sort of create initiatives that not only were training programs, but also were jobs. Because that ultimately is what you need here, right? That's, what, that's where you're gonna make a difference. So, um, you know, and again, writers were the most obvious thing to me because um, that's sort of what you, once something is into current series, that's where it all starts, the writing. You know, you're not doing anything until someone starts to write this stuff. So I thought there was an opportunity there. So um, I just got into a place where I just then remembered like my growing up and it's just like, did I ever see myself on screen in any, in any sort of real strong way? I mean, my era was, there was a Fat Albert there, a Jackson 5 cartoon there, but you know, I'd be hard pressed to sort of think about any other cartoon that like, and again, I'm specifically referencing cartoons now that, that that I saw myself and certainly from a standpoint of creative leadership and senior leadership, um, we needed to, and I say we collectively, meaning the entertainment industry needed to do a lot better. And I also wanted to make sure that I didn't get too overwhelmed by it because, you know, working in the DEI space as um, Raquel can tell you, it's, it's, it's hard. It's a, it's a heavy lift. So 
um, for me, it was just a matter of like, okay, here's my area at TVA. Let me do what I can do at TVA. Um, in my little sandbox, as I called it, just to sort of make even an incremental change, right? And the writing program was born out of that. Our music apprenticeship was born out of that. And it was just sort of, and oftentimes it was utilizing the resources that we already had. It was just configuring them now to a different, uh, a different, a different group of people. So um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done here. Is there a lot more work to do? Yeah, I think everyone will admit you want you want um, uh, to have as as diverse group of people working on your shows as you have in, uh, in in front of the screen as well, you know. So I think that's what we that's that's what we've been challenged to do, and um, I'm happy that Disney had given me the opportunity to do this um, because it was really a to a certain degree, create your own job here. And I never thought, I never thought my career trajectory would go that, would go that route, so. I do wanna acknowledge one of our questions in the Q&A box. And Gina asks, when you talk about relatable characters, when's the first time you saw yourself represented on screen and I think you touched on that a little bit in your last answer but is there like a particular moment that sticks out to you um again I guess it depends on the question in in, in animation or just in general because in animation yeah I mean it absolutely was back to sort of uh Fat Albert and Jackson 5 like that's the only like as we continue to speak about this I don't I can't think of maybe Franklin and John Brown, but Franklin just like was just sort of hanging out there, you know. Uh, um, but I grew up during the Good Times and Sanford and Sutton Jeffersons, and um, again, in, in 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 my age, like I didn't equate that. I, I I didn't equate that to wow, that representation is so false. Um, you know, when you're a kid and you're, you got time to watch TV, you watch TV. I mean, so, um, but I don't remember, uh, you know, I remember, and this is probably only a few folks in this call probably remember, I remember thinking that the TV show Julia with Diane Carroll, who she was like, she was a working mom and she was so sophisticated and stuff. And that was like, that was to me like, huh, okay, that, 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 I don't remember the show. I just remember the show, if that makes sense. You know, I can't pull out an episode, but I just remember that show existed and, and thinking that, wow, that's like, you know, I, I remember saying, like, that's like my mom. That's like my mom. Okay. So I'm finally seeing someone who not only looks like me, but sort of acts like my family, you know? I mean, I think the Cosby show um, did that for a lot of people um, uh, in the eighties. Um, but for me, that's where I just, rem I remember thinking that it was a, a, a calm, cool, sophisticated working woman. Oh, that's like my mom. Okay. You know, this, and I didn't see much of that, you know? If, if, if at all, sort of growing up. I think to expand on that, is there a particular form of representation right now that you think you're really proud of? Well, I mean, I would say obviously um, from, from, a, from a Disney perspective, you know, obviously uh, the Proud family, you know, we, 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 the characters are really, uh, again, dimensional. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, Bruce, Bruce Smith, the creator of Proud Family, who worked on a number of different features, including Princess and the Frog, and really talented, and Ralph Farquhar, who, you know, was the, worked on, I think, created Moesha and all those shows, like, partnered up for a, a, new, a reboot of, 
um, the early 2000s series. Um, the show that we just released two weeks ago, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, I think perhaps is one of the best representations that I could see where it's like, like I have a daughter who is of that, she's a little older than that, but just to see uh, a young black girl who is smart and funny and intelligent and, um, and is a superhero and has a dinosaur. Um, and and it, it's it's just a, it's a really well done show, and you know I think this is what we're sort of moving to, and I think this is you know some of the work that we've done um, has helped sort of create an environment where we can start to um, um, produce and develop these shows and identify show creators who who have that lived experience and. Um, and provide the, the, the talented, but provide the point of view um, of that life lived that makes a show feel and truly be authentic. Is there a particular course, this question is from Wes Whiteside, is there a particular course that you took at SU that you feel like you draw on constantly during your career? Or does it vary? Yeah, no, it's, it was more, it was less about the classes and more about the people. I had a very, mm. I, I think I had a couple of teachers, um, instructors, professors who I sort of connected with, um, uh, Richard Wright, um, um, Peter Moeller, Richard Breyer. Um, these are the folks that I remember, Sharon Hollenbeck, um, these are the folks I just, rem I remember being in their class. <laughs> I can't say I remember the classes, you know, but I remember being in their class and, and just sort of being fascinated with the fact that, that they had those jobs because that actually sort of came to my mind and still does in terms of whether I finish, when I finish up our Disney or even now turn this point. And because I interact with so many students, it's just like, could I be a instructor, professor? I'm mean, probably not a professor, like I don't have the, but, but that world is very special to me. And I can see segueing um, to that post Disney, or like I said, just in, in, in conjunction with what I do at Disney, because, I kind of do it anyway. I do a lot of school outreach, as you know, and the pan the pandemic, you know, as horrific as it was, opened up a small door of being able to talk to more and more students because now we we weren't traveling. I wasn't traveling, so it was now a push of a button, and now I can give I can I give school presentations to schools throughout the country. I wasn't limited myself to, oh, schools, only schools that have good communications or screenwriting programs or, you know, whatever. Now it's just like, okay, you know, the University of Kentucky say, saw, saw on LinkedIn that I had presented to Syracuse and said, hey, can you, you know, do a presentation here? I'm happy to. So, um, so, um, uh, so yeah, that, that was sort of my, my sort of experience. What I do remember at Syracuse from my freshman year is it's where I learned about, notwithstanding the wonderful life example I gave in high school, um, back in those days, I don't know, they, they may still have it now, they had two little movie theaters that they played movies on Saturday, Friday nights and Saturday nights, somewhere on the quad, I, near the quad, I can't remember what building. And they had these, they had the movies that were out right now in the theaters and the, you know, big buck. And then they had the sort of old, old films. And that's where I first saw Maltese Falcon. That's where I first saw Casablanca. That was when I, where I first saw um, Citizen Kane. I just, I was eating that stuff up and that really got me connected to, um, um, to this industry. And, and I knew I, I chose right when I just, I had that opportunity as well, so. So as we begin to wrap up, I know we're coming close on time. 
I want to ask, what does Black history mean to you? Um, you know, um, I've always had sort of a mixed emotion with that and that it's sort of, oh, February is Black History Month. You, you know, like if you're Black, you've lived Black history your entire life every single day. So um, while, I, while there are aspects of it that we are highlighting certain things about our Black heritage, our Black culture, that's fantastic. But in my, in my work now, I make it a point to make sure that if something makes sense in July, that's when we, you know, <laughs> that's when we're going to celebrate it, you know? Um, I, there's, there's sort of a cliche tagline now, which is accurate, but it's just like, you know, uh, Black history all year long. And that's true, but it's not new, I think, to Black people. <laughs> you know, we've always sort of been doing that. Um, but if we want to sort of utilize and if we can sort of, you know, um, teach or share something that someone who um, who wouldn't be aware of um, what Black history and Black culture is, um, specifically in this country, then, you know, you know, February, Black History Month becomes very useful if even one person picks up on something that they that they that they weren't were aware of before. So, you know, for me, I I again I appreciate it, um, but uh, I, I've never felt boxed in by it. You know, and especially in the work that we do now, it's a it's a it's a celebration for every day. The same way it should be for all cultures and all heritages, you know. And I think as a as a group of people collectively just trying to survive <laughs> life, um, um, just having that awareness and having that um, spirit of inclusion for all cultures, for all people, uh, would make for a better world. Appreciate that, Jay. Thank you. What are you looking forward to the most in the coming year? Well, short term, just trying to get home. So we were talking earlier about this, that there was a blizzard warning for Southern California. So I don't know what's going on right now. Um, and I, 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 I truly was saddened by the fact that I couldn't get into Syracuse. It's been so long since I've been there and I just knew that, okay, this would be the time and uh, it, it didn't happen. Um, you know, my kids are at an age now where they are, you know, heading to college, they are driving, they are becoming young adults. Um, you know, my, uh, uh, my whole life is sort of centered around the family. And so, you know, whenever I get asked the question of what I'm looking forward to, it tends not to be my career. It tends to be what's coming up for them. You know, um, we were talking earlier about my daughter looking at schools now and I just yeah. I put my son at LMU freshman year. So these are things that I couldn't even imagine when when my kids were born and, and here it is, and it felt like it was just yesterday. So um, um, it goes by fast. So, you know, and, and I would say the one piece of advice I would give to students at Syracuse is embrace the moment, don't take it for granted. I felt like I took it for granted a little bit. I was that person who always wanted to work if I had my choice, I probably wouldn't have even gone to college, um, to be frank. Um, and um, I'm glad I did, obviously. And I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad my mom, after my freshman year, because um, I actually got a job at Major League Baseball Films um, after my freshman year. And I thought it was a summer job. And, and the guy who hired me, who was a Syracuse alum, said, no, 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 like, this is we give summer jobs to our cousins and whatnot. You just, you know, you, 
And I was like, in my head, it was like, well, that was the rationale for going to school. Now that I got this job, I'm good. And I called my mom all excited. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I made her cry. She said, please don't do this. Stay in school. And I was heartbroken in that moment. But a mom's tears, nothing you can do about that. So <laughs> I had to turn that down and go back to school. And like I said, all the rest of the stuff you know, came out of that. So I am glad that that happened. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know that I really sort of embraced the entire college experience. So um, that would be a piece of advice I would give is just like, take it all in, you know, um, enjoy every moment of it because um, work is fun, but it's it's hard being responsible for other people trust me so i will fully receive that and try to really uh soak in these last couple months of college Absolutely. we are closing in on the last two minutes i got some lightning round questions for you what is your favorite disney animated character you said stitch, stitch. is there any one other one that comes to mind or are you going to stick firmly on stitch um, i'm going to stay on stitch although i will say in terms of i get asked what what's my other you know favorite movies and you know i always enjoyed from from the pixar side of it incredibles okay uh, that was that so I'll, I'll i'll go with that solid if you had to live in one of your animated worlds where would you live um wow good question uh, but in one of my animated worlds, I would say probably it would be um, Moon Girl. Okay. Yeah. And that's the new one that just came out, that's right? That's the new one, yeah. So you guys okay, have to so go see that to sort of get a we sense. check of it out. Yeah. And my last question, who has the best theme song? Oh, Moon Girl. Really? Yeah, you got so um, Raphael Sadiq did all the music for Moon Girl from Tony, Tony, Tony. So there's the soundtrack to Moon Girl. So even if you don't see the show, plug in your Spotify or your Apple Music and just listen to the tracks on uh, on the soundtrack for for Moon Girl. It's uh, it kicks. So I think the me and the audience will have to go check out Moon Girl after this, but I'm probably going to stick firmly on like a, a Phineas and Ferb, like yeah, no, that, yeah, and that's cool, a, a classic. Yeah, and that's cool. You know, I think that um, um, you, I, 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 I'm fascinated by the fact that how many people just of all walks of life just connected into Phineas because it is such a sort of I know what we're gonna to do today sort of mentality. It's just like that 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 freedom of just like, okay, today I'm gonna to do this. I think everyone can relate to. Thank you for your time, Jay. We really appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure, man. And you know, we were joking earlier, it's like we have not met each other in person yet. <laughs> we Still. thought this was gonna be it. Um, but we'll get there. We'll get there. No, it, it, it'll happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. I want to thank everyone for having me, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate being here. And um, thank you.